Well, uh, very good morning, uh, everyone. This is um, Tarun Khurana here. Also on the screen, uh, you see Reni, um, who is the managing partner of uh, um, a very prominent firm in Singapore uh, called Alpha and Omega. And I welcome her. Uh, this is the first webinar that we're doing uh, with another law firm uh, in Singapore. And therefore, uh, uh, we've at Khurana and Khurana, uh, most of you uh, would be aware we've been doing a lot of events. Uh, uh, in the last uh, 40 days on um, various aspects of intellectual property and commercial corporate law, as well as data protection. And as, as part of the series of the webinars that we are doing, uh, uh, we thought it's important for uh, a lot of Indian and foreign colleagues to also um, have a flavor of uh, how IP systems are in other parts of the globe. And we thought uh, which other country better than Singapore to start that practice with. And therefore, um, I, I asked up Rani if... Uh, we can do the first uh, round of webinars with her and then maybe go on a country by country basis uh, to see if we can give him more exposure. So be be before it's 11 o'clock and we start, uh, I would then um, let Reni give a quick background and introduction. Reni, over to you, but um, feel free to give it uh, from um, you know, how you've been able to scale up and what kind of practice do you run. And then we'll start the session at, uh, in a couple of minutes. Okay, thanks so much, Tarun. So first, I must say thank you to Tarun and Prana, Prana to actually invite me to join in this webinar. Uh, it's a pleasure and honor to um, you know, share with you a little bit about pattern strategies in Singapore, like what's the best way. Um, for those of you who are here, thank you so much for your time. Um, also to my colleagues, some of them I see from Singapore who have also joined. Thank you and welcome. Um, also, um, I'd like to say that this can be... Get can get a little bit technical because um, parenting is very technical. So please bear with me. But what we will share during the during this session is um, what would be the most strategic uh, way to um, secure your patents in Singapore. So I think when we look at um, strategic, right, um, Tarun, I mean, please do correct me and my colleagues here as well, all of you um, participants. To me, it would be the quality of the patent. I think we'd want to, any um, company would want to get a good quality patent. So when I talk about quality patterns, I think we look at the examining body because certain examining bodies, um, you know, are very stringent in their, in their examination. And so we know that once it, um, you know, that examining body has actually um, allowed the pattern or granted the pattern, we know we have a quality pattern, which can then be easily accepted in other countries. Um, and so I'll also be sharing with you that, you know, when you get a Singapore patent, it's certainly much more easier to get a patent in the ASEAN countries, if that's of interest to you. Uh, the other nine ASEAN countries, I'll share that with you as well. Um, then the other thing about being very strategic, I think, is also the, um, the time you take to get that patent granted. Um, of course, we know that um, for patenting, you can actually play around with time. Uh, that is one great advantage because it's very costly. So every time you take some action to on your patent application, you actually um, spend money. And there, there are long periods of time that you can make use of. But there are also companies that uh, would like their patents to be granted really quick. And so Singapore has got certain um, accelerated um, uh, processes in place for you to get your patents even as quick as six months. Uh, this was uh, announced a couple of days ago, so I'll share a bit more about that as well. And um, finally, of course, cost effective. That would be something to, to be very, if you want to you know, look at patent strategies, then you also want to be cost effective. So there are methods that, um, that will help with the cash flow um, and also um, methods that uh, save cost. Yeah. Uh, a little bit about my background. So I started Alpha and Omega Law Corporation about 17 years ago. Uh, we are a business law firm. We focus a lot on IP. And, you know, I met um, Tyron years ago and we meet almost every year, uh, except for this year. Um, because of the situation, we will not be meeting. Unlikely, right, Tyron? I don't think you'll be attending any conferences as well. Yeah. So that's a little bit of my background. Thanks. That's it. Uh, thank you very much, Reni. I'm Tarun Khurana. I'm one of the founding partners at Khurana and Khurana. We are uh, IP and commercial law practice uh, based across 10 offices in India. <clears throat> we are a set of 180 professionals. And uh, I think rest everything is largely known to most of the professionals who are, who are sort of on board. So thank you everyone for joining in uh, um, as, as part of uh, how we intend to conduct this webinar. Uh, 
please feel free to uh, ask questions after uh, we've completed a first round of questions from our side. We have about five or six aspects that both Renny and I will be talking about. And I think once we have covered our respective perspectives, uh, please feel free to uh, ask questions uh, or, or either put them in the chat box and we will then uh, look at one question at a time and try and answer that. So the first thing that uh, both of us will try and highlight was the patent protection system in respective countries, um, the process, uh, the timelines and the approximate uh, cost structures. And uh, to answer that question, at least from an Indian perspective, and I would like to keep it brief, at least from my side, um, is, is, uh, an, is, is a man, yes, Mr. Saha, are you saying? Hello? Right, so um, um, to continue, uh, uh, I mean, the Indian patent practice uh, in, is largely the is largely consistent across the globe. I mean, we have inventors, and there are uh, they're sort of natural persons who've done a particular invention. They said sort of then go ahead and file for a patent application where the application is filed in the name of applicants who eventually end up owning the rights to the patent application, and then uh, uh, the application could either be a provisional or a complete. Uh, that can be filed in India, and then we get 12 months to file an uh, international application uh, outside uh, in India, which is the PCT application essentially. So we can either file a PCT within 12 months and then go into the respective countries within 30 months, uh, which is in Singapore, US, Canada, or uh, we can uh, essentially uh, adopt the Paris Convention route and then directly go into the countries of our preference instead of going through the PCT uh, process. Uh, in India, it usually um, um, is a process which takes a filing and then the application by default gets published after 18 months. Uh, you could also file an early publication request for the application to be published earlier than that, uh, which is uh, one month from the date of request for early publication. We then get four years, which is 48 months from the first date of filing in India uh, to uh, file the examination request. And then from the date of examination request, depending on the kind of examination request it is and uh, which examiner does the application get allotted to, it takes between a year and a half to two and, two and a half years for the examiner or the controller to issue the first examination report, which then needs to be replied back to in six months of time. And once you've replied back to an examination report, if the examiner is convinced uh, with the response to the technical and the formality objections, he will allow the patent, which happens in only about 15-20% of the cases. And the balance, 80% of the cases essentially go uh, to the hearing, where the examiner would then issue an, a hearing notice, and then would a hearing would need to be attended either physically or through a VC, a video conferencing um, a session, post which a reply to the hearing notice needs to be given in 15 days. And after that is when the patent eventually, a decision is taken on whether to allow or refuse uh, the patent application. So that's the general process of uh, patent application from filing till the end. The process takes anywhere between a minimum of a year and a half to two. That's the least that you can expect in most cases. And, um, and it could go up to six, seven years, depending on when you file the examination request. <clears throat> the cost structure, again, in India, there are three types of entities. There are small entities, there are natural persons, and uh, there are large entities. So the fees is uh, fairly varied. So it's about a thousand, uh, about a hundred dollars for the filing for a large entity. I mean, that is what I will focus on and everything becomes one fifth the cost. So it's about twenty twenty dollars for, uh, uh, for filing of a, uh, an application, in the name of an individual. And then uh, we, uh, you know, the whole process uh, end to end uh, would usually have a, uh, you know, an, uh, an official fee for an entity, for a legal entity, for a large entity to be approximately around $400. And then um, uh, at the same time, the attorney fees from the start till the end would typically from uh, the filing till the grant of the patent or the decision on the patent application would be around uh, $2,000. So that's the approximate cost structure. And I can go into further details if there are questions uh, around that. Renny, how was it at your end? I mean, could you highlight the process and the implications and the cost details at a high level? 
<laughs> okay, sure. Um, guys, I think what I'll do is I'll just share my screen because um, we are very similar. Um, the processes um, are very similar to what you have in, in India. But um, I'll just share my screen to show you some flow charts so that um, it might be more helpful for those who are not so familiar. Um, and for those who are really experts, then please do bear with me as well. And, um, you know, any questions, just uh, let me know. Okay, so um, maybe we start with, um, so of course there are various routes that Karen has already spoken about in India, which we have in Singapore too. Um, so if we look at this first one that I'm showing to you, uh, which is the national um, patent application, right? So of course, um, before you commence your application, you would um, start off with um, an optional search if you wanted to, and then you would go into the drafting of the patent specification. So um, I'd like to just talk about the cost here, right? Um, so the cost here, there's no um, official fee. When we talk about official fee, we are talking about the registry's fee. Um, there's no registry fee. So we are only talking about the professional fee. Estimated, um, if you came for drafting to a Singapore law firm um, or a patent attorney, you would look at an estimated uh, searching cost of about 6,000 uh, sing which would be about four, 5,000 US. And similarly, uh, another 6,000 sing for drafting of the patent specification, okay? So uh, here we are looking at um, inventions which are not too technical um, and not, um, yeah, so sort of mid-range uh, inventions, okay? Then we could start with this first method. You could choose this first method, okay? So whether you're a Singapore company, or an Indian company or from any country, you could start with this method in Singapore where you actually um, file uh, a national patent application in Singapore. And that would of course be your priority date. And then within 12 months, you actually file in the relevant countries that you want to also secure protection of your invention in. Okay, so this is the first method, all right. Then we have a second method where after your national application, okay, again, the priority date is at the national application. Within 12 months, you file what's called a PCT application, okay? And within 18 months of this PCT application, right, within 18 months, you go into all the PCT member states of importance to you or relevant to you. Okay, currently, I believe, um, Taran, if I'm not mistaken, there are about 170 uh, member states. So, yeah. yeah. So, um, just generally to also share for those who are less familiar, what is this PCT application, right? Um, it doesn't really give you any rights. It doesn't give you grants in any of the PCT member states, right? At the most, um, I would say, uh, I'd like to refer to it as a reservation of rights. Okay, so you file the PCT application and basically you have reserved your rights um, in the member state um, countries. Okay, and at the end, you still have to select um, within that uh, 18 months, 18 months, right? You have to select which country you want to go into. Okay, uh, please um, just stop me uh, at any point uh, if I'm going too fast or it's difficult. So you can see from the first, the priority date to going into the relevant um, countries, um, there's 30 months there. Okay, and this really helps cash flow as well. You start with something small because it's less expensive to start with a national application. In Singapore, if you start with a national application, um, excluding the costing for search and patent, and patent drafting, um, just oh. find... A national application in Singapore may cost you about thousand three sing mm -hmm. with the professional fee. Yes, is somebody asking a question? No. Okay, I carry on. Okay, so this method um, is quite good for your cash flow. Uh, it allows you more than twelve months to you know to, to consider then filing a PCT application. Okay. Another method would be after drafting your patent specification, you just go directly and file your PCT application. Okay, and then from there, you have uh, 30 months 
to go into the relevant member states. So never forget, never forget that whether you go um, the first method where you file your national application um, or you file a PCT application, you have a bunch of countries which are not PCT member states, right? They are not PCT member states, which means you must file in those countries within 12 months of your priority date. Okay, so don't forget that one. Huh? Yeah. Um, so oh, that, uh, yes. I just had one question. Um, a lot of uh, clients have been obviously asking us about uh, there are certain clients uh, in technology areas which have subsidiaries or uh, entities which are incorporated in Singapore, and they they keep asking us like they, have, they like India has a provisional versus complete filing system, and even the US has a provisional versus non non provisional, and there are many other countries that don't really have a concept of that nature at all. How is Singapore structured there? And if, if somebody was to protect his interest provisionally and uh, not really then want to file a complete for strategic reasons, uh, because you didn't really talk about provisional versus complete, I mean, could you just throw some light? Is there a provision at all uh, where you could hold your rights for 12 months? Yeah. Um, actually, we don't call it a provisional application like in the US. Uh, we don't call it a provisional. But what you are allowed to do is file your patent application without your claims and then file your claims within 12 months. So it really works like the, like the US provisional, but they don't call it that. It's just that the Patents Act in Singapore allows you to file your claims 12 months later. But yeah. can you actually amend the specification at the time of filing the claims after 12 months, within that 12 month period when you're filing it? You can amend, but sometimes if your amendment is substantial, so you've got added matter, right? Um, then what we would suggest is to withdraw, to, to file the new application claiming the priority of the, the so-called provisional, okay? And then after that, withdraw that provisional. Yeah, so the benefit is actually to just get that provisional, that so-called provisional application's uh, filing date. Right. Okay. Could you, add, could you, like in India, for example, you have an option of filing multiple provisionals. You file one, you, uh, you know, like which would include A, B, C, and then you maybe um, add an element D to it and there is an improvement. So you will file another provisional two months down the lane and then you'll file another third provisional. How does that work? I mean, as regards, could you really file multiple applications and combine all of that together so that you can have multiple priorities? You can, but it's not so straightforward. You Basically, at the end of the day, right, you need to meet the requirements of um, novelty that, you know, you have not sort of um, uh, disclosed, um, you know, you haven't, past the, the, the disclosure time and things like that. So um, technically, I guess it's possible, but it's not done that frequently. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So, so far, any questions about this? Um, you know, the process, as you can see, is very similar to India. Um, we have the same methods. And I think selecting, if you look strategically, selecting your method, right? Um, really depends on what is it you're looking for. If it's cash flow, then you may want to take the longest route possible. Um, and also it gives you a chance to, I mean, for me, for my, for my clients in Singapore, um, individual inventors, I always ask them to um, try to take the longest route because it also gives them an opportunity to push the invention out into the market and see how receptive the market is to the invention. Um, because we know that parenting is expensive. Okay. So I'll just move on. Taran, shall I just move on to the, the accelerated timelines? Like what can we do? Um, and it, it will also address your provisional application with this one, uh, because if you want to take advantage of these accelerated timelines in the Singapore uh, patent system, right, then the provisional is not good. Okay. okay? So, so you can see here on my screen, right, that right now we have two um, um, fast track patterns, right? First one is called the SG patent fast track. Yes, can you, can you say that again? Hello? Arindam, I think you might have to mute uh, the colleague who probably is the background noise coming in. Yeah, yeah, doing that, just a second. Let me go ahead, please continue. Right. So to accelerate your patent examination in Singapore, we can choose the SG patent fast track or the 12 months file to grant. 
Okay, these are the two programs available. So we had until about last week, the FinTech Fast Track, which was called the FTFT. And then we also had the Accelerated Initiative for Artificial Intelligence. Now all this will come to an end latest by the 3rd of May to be replaced by the SG Pattern Fast Track. All right, so let's look at the SG Pattern Fast Track. It commences from the 4th of May. And it's a pilot project. It's only here for two years. So it will expire on the 29th of April, 2022. Um, what they say, they announced it on the 27th of April, a couple of days ago. Uh, what has been announced is that you can get a grant as fast as six months. Okay, so you must look at these words, as fast as, right? Which, does, which you know, really doesn't mean that you will get it in six months, okay? Um, it covers all inventions across all technological uh, sectors. So it doesn't matter what your invention is, if it's a technological invention covered, you can use, utilize this. And for now, uh, there's no acceleration fee, but I believe they will be looking into this uh, because they've already sort of mentioned that in time to come, they will have an acceleration fee. Okay, so what, what do you need in order to qualify for this SG pattern fast track? right? You, your Singapore filing must be the first filing, which means you can't start, for most of you um, participants who are from India, you can't start in India and then come into Singapore and try to use this. It won't work, okay? You just won't qualify. Then your invention must have fewer than 20 claims, right? Now, within IPOS, uh, they have a cap of only five applications per month. So basically, first come, first come. Whoever files requesting for this LG pattern fast track will get it, the first five applicants. Okay. And for each applicant, all right, you have a cap. Uh, in a year, you can only request for 10 applications using the SG pattern fast track. And you must, in all of your applications, you must provide a reason why you want an accelerated pattern. Okay. So one of the reasons could be that you have investors coming in potential investors and it's um, for the invent investor um, you know there is a requirement to have a patent granted in order for them to invest can be one of the reasons okay um, any questions for that so far I've covered that the SG pattern fast track uh, is it for some technologies in specific or is it completely technology um, because a lot of these ex uh, expedited express uh, uh, mechanisms, for example, are more pr promoting usually green technologies or clean technologies in that sense. So is this um, uh, technology agnostic? Well, they say that it covers all technologies. I, I'm very sure because it's, you know, it takes over from the uh, fintech and the AI um, fast track patterns. So definitely those are going to be covered, right? And definitely green technology because that's uh, the way forward as well. A lot of technology coming out of that. Um, Internet of Things, all those sort of things I suspect will be covered as well. But yeah, it's pretty broad if it's just said all technologies. Uh, Rani, there are a couple of questions in the chat. Um, can you see them or should I read them out? Uh, okay. I, I, I'll read them out. I'll read them out uh, so that you don't have to skip your presentation. So it says, hi Rani, then uh, what's the provisional application known as in Singapore Patent Act? What is it called <laughs> I mean, if it's not a provisional? I don't think they call it anything. They just allow for you to file your patent application without the claims. That's it. So it's just a regular um, invention pattern. And the act allows for claims to be filed 12 months later. But what, uh, how, what percentage of applicants adopt that according to you? I mean, like 60% applicants or 90% go without uh, yeah. this uh, route at all? I, I would say maybe only about 20 to 30% utilize this. Yeah. All right, so th there's another question. Uh, could you please explain, um, does Singapore follow the same, just one second, there are quite a few there. So does Singapore follow the same principle like in India where granted patents are not presumed to be valid under section 13.4, for example, like Indian Patent Act, it is, there's no presumption of validity is what they call it. You cannot presume it to be valid. Uh, and therefore, uh, uh, you know, anybody can challenge the validity thereof during an infringement proceeding. Uh, it's not that by default it will be valid. The validity would have to be assessed after the grant as well. Is it that? Uh, is it? Is it how it is in Singapore as well? 
Yes, I mean, validity can be challenged in Singapore as well. Um, so validity differ, differs from infringement. Eh? So you can get a granted patent, but you could still have an infringement action brought against you. Okay, but the validity of the patent could be challenged in the sense that maybe you're not the right to own them, maybe it was done in bad faith, and those sort of things can be challenged. There are provisions in that sense. But, I mean, but once the patent is granted, it is not presumed to be valid. I mean, is there a specific mentioning of that or a connotation of that in the Singapore Patent Act, for example, which says that it's, it's because in Indian Patent Act, it says that examiners have done their best and they've granted the patent in context, but there's no presumption of validity. There's no liability, for example, on the examiners. There is no, so it can always be challenged. I mean, I do understand even otherwise you can challenge it, but in India, it is explicitly said that during, for example, if somebody files, um, uh, you know, uh, an infringement suit, uh, the, 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 the judges or the high court and context would not really presume that the patent is valid by default, you know, in that sense. So how, how is it uh, in Singapore, if you could just throw a light? So there's no express provision that says that it's presumed to be valid and, and therefore that gives you a right to maybe, you know, seek damages or things like that, right? From the uh, registry or from the courts um, because they have examined and provided, but there are provisions to allow for the invalidation of the patent. Okay, so you see, uh, it's, uh, it's not uh, expressly stated that it's valid. It says that this is how you can get a granted patent. Okay. And this is how you can, a third party can invalidate the patent. Yeah. Sure. And this is a question by Dr. Balakrishnan who says, uh, can you please explain the process of patent application? How many months does it take from the patent application to the original application? I don't know what parent application. I'm sorry. So how much, how many months does it take from the parent application to the original application? And when can we go for publication in 12 to 18 months in India? So, I mean, the question is not very clear, but perhaps uh, uh, am I correct to assume that obviously you file without the claims, for example, in that route, you file uh, with the claims uh, with the largely the same subject matter and specification in 12 months and the application would then get published in 18 months, but that 18 months will be calculated from the first filing that was without the claims, right? Yes. So I yes. think that answers the question is also 18 months, yeah. Uh, there's one more question. Uh, I think that's for me. They say um, uh, how an Indian applicant can file a patent in a fast track mode and without first filing uh, in India. So um, I, we will come down to uh, expedited examination processes in the next uh, question. So maybe if you could just hold for 15 more minutes, 10 more minutes, and then if that question doesn't get answered, feel free to ask me again. Rennie, you want to complete uh, the, the expedited processes that you were explaining? Yeah. Okay. So just to go back, uh, so earlier we had this one, uh, the SG patent fast track. Now another expedited one is the 12 months file to grant, right? So this one, it actually tells you that you will get a grant within a period of 12 months, right? The other one, they say you can get it as fast as six months. And this one is for any, any, any technology, any patents, uh, even um, because you know, Singapore doesn't have a utility um, patent, uh, structure so all patents are invention patents so even on technology patents um, you can you have to file it as an invention patent like i don't know in india do you have utility uh, term so do we follow utility patents only i mean that is how it is india there's no utility model it's not called the the, the invention patent as well but we call it as a utility patent all right okay so filing to grant within a period of 12 months and so what are the requirements? Okay, you must request for examination at the time of filing. If you want to utilize this, okay, you must request for the examination at the time of filing. You cannot have any formalities deficiencies. So this one, not so much for the applicant, but I guess for the attorneys who are working on it. You cannot, um, uh, so basically your first search and examination that the um, examiner comes up with must be completely favorable. Okay, so if there's a report, written opinion uh, where you have problems with novelty and inventiveness and all that, then you will, you will just fall out of this 12 months to grant. And your payment for your publication and grant must be made within two months of receiving the notice of eligibility. Okay, so if you follow all this, then yes, you can get your grant within 12 months, which I think in a way um, answers uh, one of the questions just now, like how long does it take, right? from filing to grant. So this is one way you can do it within 12 months. Otherwise, generally it would take between two to three years. But does this uh, route also require that the first application be 
In Singapore? No need. Can be either way. It can be um, um, based on a priority filing or a first filing in Singapore. But then the first search and examination report being favorable is really not in your hands, right? Yeah. I mean, so that's probably just a way of writing it. But you know, anybody I, not wanting to follow the 12 months file to grant uh, platform would really not give you a positive uh, search examination. Doubt yeah. They sort of use uh, some um, uh, sort of distinct prior art and try and relate it to your invention somehow, at least uh, to move away from the 12 month uh, parameter. Possible. So I guess you'd be very, I think like, you know, if you get one of those, we saw those patterns where your international search report or your corresponding application report has been, you know, just, just a breeze, you know, no problems at all. Uh, then the chances of you getting this um, completely favorable first search and examination is much higher than you could meet. Yeah. But if it's in doubt, right, then um, you won't get it. But I feel that there's no harm in trying. Of course. Um, the disadvantage, I guess, is you, um, you know, from a cash flow perspective, right, you don't have the benefit of waiting uh, 36 months from the date of filing because we have until three years from the date of filing or the priority date to request for the examination, right? So um, then there's that particular cost. You're looking at about a cost of about 2005 US uh, to request such an examination. So if you want to do this 12 months thing, that all that has to be paid upfront. But if you're okay about not having a grant within 12 months, then you take your time to request for the search and examination. But there's no additional fee. It's just the same fee, but you'll have to pay in advance. Yes. Yeah. No there's additional. a question. Uh, so there's a question uh, for you, uh, Randy. Could you uh, share the details pertaining to the office actions? Uh, for example, how many office actions can we expect What's the timeline to file a response to each office action? And is there like in India, we have an oral hearing, as I'd mentioned, uh, once the examiner is not convinced with a reply, he will give you an opportunity for a hearing and no application in India can be refused without a hearing opportunity. Is there a similar process there or can you really request for a hearing as well? You can request for a dialogue with the examiner. Okay, that is possible. Um, how many months, uh, once you get a written opinion, that's what we call it, a uh, written opinion, you have five months to, response, to respond. But that deadline is not extendable. Yeah? So we must meet that five months, otherwise the pattern will lapse. And how many such office actions can you expect? Um, there, is no, um, there is no limit, actually. Generally, you would find people you know, give up after the third round because it's expensive as well to keep trying to, to overcome this yeah and uh, so just to maybe simplify uh, the process a little bit uh, uh, you know if you keep the 12 month uh, file to grant process on the side as well as the 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 previous uh, mechanism or the route that we talked about which were exceptional cases in a usual case if you could just simplify you file an application with the claims when would a typical applicant file the examination request say in, i understand he gets three years through that but usually, would they file it with the exam, with the application filing itself? Very rarely. So they'll try to file somewhere between two to three years. Yeah, mostly before the third, third year, just before the deadline, the six months. So they file both the search and the examination request together. Then it has, yeah. to, it has to go together. Yeah. So maybe I can just share share a little bit more about this. Huh? So once you file your application in Singapore, of course, all applications have to be um, examined. In order for the examination to take place, there must be a search. So Singapore, you have this option, or you have three options, okay? The first one being, you can just request for a search and then subsequently examination. But if you want to do this method, you must request for the search within 13 months of your filing, your date of filing, okay? Or your priority date. Following this method is okay if you are not confident about your pattern at all. Okay, so you, you can, then it works out a little cheaper because your request for search, um, just purely request for search would be about, say, say about 1,005 US. Uh, and then if the search, you know, comes out to be unfavorable, you decide, okay, I'm not going to proceed any further. That's your loss. That's it. You cut your losses at that point. Okay. Um, but however, if the search report is favorable and then you want to go ahead and request for the examination as well, you actually end up spending another 1,005 to 1,006 for the request for examination. Okay, so that is one method. 
Then the second method is you request for search and examination at the same time. Mm. And the cost for that is about 1,006,007 US. Okay, and that you do before 36 months from the date of filing or the priority date. And then the third option is you request for examination relying on um, an international search report or a corresponding application search report. So corresponding application would be like US, Europe, uh, Korea. We've got a few countries that are corresponding applications. Okay. And, mm -hmm. the, and the cost for the relying on the search, you save a little bit because there's no search being done. So maybe it's about 1,002 US. Yeah, you save a little bit from the requesting search and examination. So those are the three that's available now. All right, all right. So a couple of questions. I think there are a lot of questions directed towards you, Renny. So I'll speak less. <laughs> it's so complicated in Singapore, I think. So, <laughs> so good. Um, um, yeah. So the next question is, does Singapore allow grant of incremental inventions? Grant uh, of what, right? Incremental, I mean, like patent of additions, for example. Is there a patent of addition concept, uh, like a continuation in part? Uh, no, continuation no. in part in the US, CIP. Uh, no, you don't no. have anything. So every application is different? Yes. But then you do have divisional applications, right? You do have divisional applications. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, there is another question that we have down the lane, but I can maybe because somebody has asked a question around it and maybe because of the time we might have to mix and match questions around. So like there is section three in the Indian Patent Act, which talks about uh, various activities which are not eligible for patentability at all. Uh, software per se is not patentable. Section 3D is about uh, new forms of known substances are not patentable. A method of uh, treatment is not patentable. A method of doing agriculture is not patentable. So uh, could you give an idea about what, what, are, what are certain things in the US, in Singapore, which are not patentable at all from, from a non-eligibility standpoint? Same. I think same as India. Method of treatment not patentable. Um, inventions which is not good for society is uh, not patentable. Um, software patents, right? I'll just um, go down here to explain it a little bit. Huh? Okay, so software patents, it doesn't, our act doesn't prohibit it. Right? It doesn't say that it's something that you will not get a patent for. So generally, we follow um, Europe when it comes to software patents. So we got the computer implemented inventions and the computer programs. So you see, inventions which uses computers and programs to secure a technical effect, possible, still very possible. But if the invention is essentially to process information, then no, not possible. Okay, I, I hope this answers that question. That's correct. So um, yeah, so on the patent of addition, you already said there is no such concept in Singapore. Uh, there's a question, can a PCT application be filed for Singapore for patent fast track process? But the fast track you said it has to be, the first filing has to be in Singapore, right? So that question gets answered there. Uh, what is the total, I mean, it's, uh, there's a question from Bhumika, it says, what is the total strength of patent examiners in Singapore? 100. 100 people? Yes. 100 examiners, that's it? Yeah. Wow. You know, from before 14th of February 2014, uh, we had zero patent examiners and we didn't conduct any examination in Singapore. Right. All our examination was outsourced to Australia and Europe. Right, right. Then as of 14 February, 2014, um, we started examining in Singapore and within a year we had hundred patent examiners. So I think we're still around that, hovering around that. Yeah. Uh, what is the average disposal rate of applications per examiner, for example, do you have some idea around it? Sorry, one second. Average disposal rate, how many, how many applications does an examiner dispose of in a month? No idea, right? No idea, yeah. How many applications get filed in Singapore as the first filing? Do you have any idea around that? I think not very much. Uh, always say we're not a very inventive society in the sense that inventive for patent sake. Uh, I think we're about 2,000. 2,000 a year, 2,000 a month? A year. A year. For Singapore patents, I mean, originating from Singapore. And what's the allowance to refusal ratio usually in Singapore? Um, you know, they say that um, almost 60% gets granted. Yeah, or um, eventually, um, you know, after a couple of rounds, then it goes up a little bit higher. Few more questions. Does Singapore follow deferred system of examination? Can you defer your examination? And where patent applications are examined only when the examination request is filed by an applicant, 
applicant. But that's always the case, right? You, examination would never happen without the examination request being filed. Yeah, that's the only way to defer it. That's what uh, I mean. You wait for the period to request examination. How would it work when you've requested for the search but not for the examination? So the examiner would do the search but would not come back with a search report or would he come with the search report and then would yeah. he come with the search report? And usually how much uh, time does it take from the date of request for search to the report coming in? Maybe about three to five months. And then you could really avoid filing the examination request if the references identified are really close, right? So a lot of applicants might be adopting that route as well then. Uh, yeah, that would be good for like um, local. I mean, I find it, you know, the, the smaller inventors, you know, where, you know, it's, it's very costly for them to go through this whole process. Then this will be a good way. So somebody's asked also a question about uh, new forms of of of, no, of uh, known compounds, for example, like the section 3D, right? That uh, isomorphs and crystalline forms and amorphous forms are not really uh, patentable because unless they sort of demonstrate therapeutic efficacy, um, enhanced therapeutic efficacy over the main molecule. How is it in Singapore, if you could just take a minute? Same, you're in the same, same, um, I think we're we are following the same way, yes. But is there a lot of refusal on patents because of that also? Because I'm sure a lot of branded companies file for sort of from an evergreening standpoint, keep filing for new forms uh, of known devices. So is it, I mean, like in India, it's, it's implemented and uh, practiced by the examiners very, very stringently. So is it, is it likewise, or do you see that in certain cases, uh, examiners have not paid as much uh, as, I mean, the threshold is not as high as India, for example. No, I think we are quite strict actually. I mean, as soon as you know, it, it, it sort of there's a shadow of evergreening that's that's coming along, right? Um, uh, the panel examiners are very strict in Singapore. Um, in fact, that is one of the reasons why um, they, they discontinued the uh, reliance on uh, um, corresponding grants, which we used to have before, because they felt that. Um, in Singapore, the examination was much more stringent and they were just allowing a lot of patterns in uh, previously. I see. This, yeah. um, it's not a question asked, but uh, like there is a opposition process in India where you could really oppose a uh, third party can come and oppose, uh, anybody can come and oppose a file of pre-grant opposition. No such process in Singapore as of right now? No opposition, but you can invalidate. Yeah. Uh, does Singapore has uh, PT patent term extension provisionals uh, provisions available for pharmaceutical patents? Is there anything uh, where you could extend uh, the life term of a patent or any kind of like the patent terms get extended in the US? No, maximum 20 years. So irrespective of the delay on the side of the pro examination by the examiners, that doesn't really impact. Okay. Uh, so Dr. Balakrishnan has also asked about compulsory licensing provisions. Is there something like that in uh, uh, in the Patent Act of Singapore? No, we don't have uh, um, an act that um, provides for compulsory licensing. But Singapore's uh, laws can be implemented very quickly. Uh, temporary measure laws, and we've seen so much of it during this COVID-19 period. So I think it's just a matter of you know, if they decide it's good, for the society, then they will just implement it and pass it within a day. Yeah. So the next question was around uh, the PCT national phase filings, which is where more most of the Indian applicants would fall in. Uh, so an Indian applicant files in India, takes the priority, files the PCT, and then comes into Singapore. Could you tell him the available search slash examination routes or options that are available? Because they, they were three available earlier. You'll have to choose depending on how strong your IPER was or how strong your ISR was. I think that was sort of, uh, there was a big change in that practice recently. Could you indicate how an applicant, a national phase applicant coming into and filing a Singapore national phase application, what kind of routes are available for him for prosecution in Singapore, which is according to you the most optimal way of prosecuting an application in Singapore? Mm. So um, before, so before uh, 1st Jan 2020, you could actually rely on a grant that you have obtained in Australia, US, Japan, Korea, uh, Europe. Okay, you could realize, so if you had a corresponding uh, application granted in those countries, 
uh, before 1st January 2020, you could rely on that and then just request for supplementary examination in Singapore. And the real advantage of that is that you have no examination cost in Singapore. Okay, and if your, your Singapore pattern is, the, the examiners are uh, okay, seeing that your Singapore application is exactly the same as the corresponding granted one, they will issue you a pattern in Singapore. So there's a huge uh, cost saving chunk there. Okay, after 1st January 2020, this is no longer available. So what you have left is two methods. One, you request for a combined search and examination because you would have the earlier one I told you about the request search only is no longer available because your time limit is out, right? Um, so you would just request for a search and examination or you would request for an examination relying on the search report of one of those corresponding country applications. I those see. are the two options. Yeah. I see. I see. And um, well, uh, I have also we also contemplated about foreign filing license requirements, um, and uh, there was a question around that where, uh, like in India, any Indian resident cannot really file an application outside um, India without really obtaining. I mean, it's not about the nationality, but it's about the residency of the, of the Indian uh, inventor. So, if there's any Indian resident inventor, he has to mandatorily take a foreign filing license before he wishes to sort of go out and file for uh, any patent application, including even the PCT for that matter. How is it in Singapore? Uh, uh, what are the conditions? Because a lot of Indian companies, as I said, have their, uh, you know, some inventor or the other in Singapore, there is either a subsidy there. So if a Singapore based uh, resident Indian national wishes to file a patent application first in India, yeah. does he need to take a permission? Yes. Yes. So if you look at our section 34, right, which is up on the screen now, okay, you need to, um, if you're going to file it outside of Singapore, and if you have been resident in Singapore during the time of the invention, you must get, um, you must get permission. So what is this um, resident, what is it, um, you know, uh, the definition of it? So as long as you have a valid pass lawfully issued to you, even if you spend less than the 180 days, 180 days like under the income tax right, uh, regime, right? So even if you spend maybe even five days during the course of that invention in Singapore, the fact that you have been valid, you have a valid pass to reside in Singapore, you are considered a resident. Therefore, you must get the permission of uh, the Ministry of Law before you can file your patent outside of Singapore. Okay? And I just want to also bring about... Um, the penalties of infringing this section, right? Which is, as you know, we are a fine country, so we have five thousand dollars fine or two years in. Okay, we have had some cases like that, and the fine has been uh, moderated to about two thousand dollars. Understood. Uh, Rani, yeah. did you also have a slide on the costing? Uh, perhaps in terms of how much would it cost for somebody to file, and from, from I mean, what kind of budgets should he carry? Do you have some some slide? Did you prepare on that front as well? I don't, uh, have, okay, wait, uh, let me, let me do this, okay. But, um, Tara, would you mind if I just finished up the accelerator? Because I think that's very useful if there aren't, um, it's very useful to know how else to do it quickly and how to use the Singapore system for Southeast Asia. Of so, is that okay with everyone else if I can just finish that? Yeah, so we, we stopped here. Um, okay, I'll just rattle on. Uh, so that was for the Singapore application, right? You got the fast track and then you've got the 12 funds filed to grant. Okay, now how to use the Singapore system, the Singapore patent system to accelerate internationally, right? This is also possible. So Singapore is a member of the global PPH, right? That's one. Um, I think, Tarun, you can explain more about the PPH. It's something international. Everybody has, everybody is... Um, has that but what we also have is the ASEAN Patent Examination Corporation okay which is ASPEC um, and then we have a patent cooperation with Cambodia and Cambodia is important uh, and I'll come to that a little later because you know uh, if you have filed your patents in Cambodia you will know that you probably haven't gotten it granted yet okay because it just takes forever in Cambodia so we have something through the Singapore system that allows for a quick patent in Cambodia Okay, so if we look at ASPEC, right, it's a fast-track patenting process in any of the nine ASEAN um, offices. 
uh, it's one common form that you use. There's no additional fee that you need to pay. And common language, we use English. And so that's a huge cost saving in the form of translation cost. And um, since 27th August last year, there are two new features, two new initiatives. One of it is if you are in the industry 4.0, which is your internet of things and internet of systems and things like that, then um, the, uh, the ASEAN country is commit to a six month turnaround time for the first examination uh, report, for the first written opinion. Okay. Um, and the second measure that's available for the ASPEC countries is that you can actually request to rely on the search reports of um, ASEAN country who is also an international searching authority, which currently there are only two. One is Singapore and the other one is Philippines. Okay, so this is also very useful. Uh -huh. So this is an advantage of having a pattern in Singapore and then going into the ASEAN countries. So a few things um, um, for Cambodia, you can actually do a re-registration. So this is very useful to actually just re-register your pattern in Cambodia. Don't wait for it to be examined and things like that. And then you just have a couple of requirements, which is at the time when you make that request for re-registration, your patent must still be enforced in Singapore. Okay? And it must have a filing date um, of um, after 22nd Jan 2003. Right? And of course, it must meet the Cambodian requirements for patentability, which is very similar, which is you know your novelty or inventiveness, things like that. Okay? Um, okay, uh, if you actually want your patent to be fully examined in Cambodia to wait through the process, then you can, you can rely on this other method, which is you request IPOS to submit a copy of the final IPOS search and examination report to uh, the Cambodian um, authorities. Okay, so yeah, I find that um, this is very good, uh, the aspect and the, um, and the Cambodian uh, route. Yeah, um, Tarun, you want to explain a bit about PPH or you think everyone is okay with it? So PPH basically uh, is a patent prosecution highway, uh, which is a mechanism of linkage between multiple countries uh, that allow flexibility and have agreed to cooperate uh, on the patent prosecution uh, efficiencies being created uh, in a manner such that, for example, India has a PPH with Japan, where uh, for a certain set of applications, um, if there is a family or an application filed in Japan corresponding to an Indian application and the Japanese application gets allowed, then that allowance has a significant bearing on a very easy and uh, efficient and quick allowance of the corresponding family application in India. So um, uh, India, for example, is fairly restrictive in terms of having a PPH only with Japan at this moment. But as uh, Reni mentions that Singapore has a global PPH. So to that effect, uh, 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 how many countries get covered in that, uh, uh, Rani? I mean, uh, obviously the main ones. Are, quite, quite a lot. I think more than thirty countries. I think more than that. Yeah. Barring, barring India, for that matter, as of right now, then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not truly really global in that sense. Yeah, I guess because EPO is in as well in US, so I think when those two are in, then they call it global. <laughs> <laughs> but have you have you practically seen uh, the other way around? I can understand because you know there are the examination standards and the the, the strength of examination, the years for, for which examiners have been doing examination in Europe, for example, is significant, right? And they're they're known to be cutthroat in that sense. So an application allowed there and a corresponding easy allowance in Singapore um, sort of is, is is digestible. But how is it the other way around usually? Have you seen an applicant where you filed an, an application in Europe, Singapore one got granted in the fast track process of 12 months, for example, the 12 month file to grant uh, process, and then you use that grant to get a, a subsequent grant in Europe as well? Mm, we have seen, we have seen. But, um, you know, generally I find Europe is quite fast. So I'm not sure is because we use the PPH route that it was fast or, um, you know, it's just generally fast anyway. Yeah. Sure. Could you also throw some light on, uh, is there any other slide of the presentation that you've not touched upon or any, maybe we can, we can sort of go through the presentation quickly on other aspects that you might. Okay. Yes. I will go back and finish up those slides. If I can find it. 
Hang on one moment. Uh. Sorry, Taryn, just hang on one minute. I wanted, I opened up to show the costing. Okay. Do you see the slides? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So the other bits um, that I had was about tax. Uh, you know, um, the kind of IP related tax incentives that we have in Singapore. Um, are we okay to do that? Sure. Um, so we have quite a few uh, tax incentives. Um, now this one I'll just skim through because I, I'm not a tax professional. So, you know, if you have like really detailed questions about things like this, then please just, um, you know, through Taran, just drop me an email or something like that. And then I'll get the answers for you. So it's not my favorite area. Um, lawyers and numbers don't go together for me. So... <laughs> I'll just tell you what we have, okay? So, enhanced tax deduction for R&D projects, okay? Uh, so, you got about 250% for staff costs and consumables, okay? Um, then, we have research incentive schemes for companies in Singapore, okay? So, you've got cash grants up to between 30 to 50% for research incentive schemes. Okay? So, all this is actually to encourage, uh, what the Singapore government is doing is to encourage businesses to, to have their um, patents um, and their IP, all their IP in Singapore because, you know, they're fully aware it generates so much of money for the country. Writing down allowance, okay, so you have on a straight line basis over a choice of 5, 10 or 15 years. Of course, there are different requirements on, uh, you know, how you would choose whether 5, 10 or 15 years and all of these got conditions. Uh, royalties and other income from IP rights also, there are concessionary uh, corporate tax rates of 5 to 10 percent. Okay, and this is for income derived from IP, uh, commercialized IP, okay. And then I think the, the biggest thing that a lot of Singapore companies and also um, a lot of foreigners are now, foreign companies are now uh, looking into as well is to set up um, small and medium enterprises in Singapore, okay. And then they qualify for a, a, a great number of government grants, not just for IP, but for so many other things as well. There are lots of government grants available to Singapore companies. So I just want to touch upon uh, what is a Singapore company. It's not good enough to just incorporate a company in Singapore and then have nominee directors. Um, that's not enough. You need to have 30% local shareholding. And 30% local shareholding would mean um, Singaporeans or Singapore permanent residents. Okay, that would qualify. So while you can have a Singapore company with just a local resident director, that does not make you a, a Singapore company for the purpose of the government grants. You need to have the 30% local shareholding. You must have a group turnover of not more than 100 million. So you could be owned by um, other companies or you could um, you know, be owned by individuals or whatever it is, but your group turnover must not be more than 100 million. Your group total employees must not be more than 200. Okay, so these... Um, are the requirements in order to have access to the government grants. Government grants can be as high as 70%. Yeah, that's what, that's what I have. Thanks, Darren. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, Renny. I think we have another five, 10 minutes uh, uh, remaining. Um, I'll then open up the dice. If anybody has any question, uh, please feel free to ask um, any of us uh, and we'll try and answer that. Any questions at all? Uh, really, there was one question in the chat box which said, uh, can you please uh, repeat, Renny, uh, what you said on basing examination on foreign patent office uh, search report? Yeah. So Singapore has got what we call corresponding application countries. And this would be US, Europe, Japan, Korea, Australia. Okay. So if you have a search report, a favorable search report from any of these countries um, for the same uh, pattern application, then you can use this in Singapore to request examination, which means Singapore will not do a, 
a, a search, they will just examine based on that corresponding application search report. Is that, is that a good, ex is that, uh, yeah. Sure. Uh, what about the costing, uh, what kind of attorney fees, what kind of budget should uh, an applicant be looking at any uh, official fees put together, say an official fees of about $3,000, is, is that correct? Uh, uh, yeah, to three thousand from from end to end completely. Yeah. Um, okay. Let me just look at my costings here. I don't know how. I don't see it so that I can share that screen. But uh, basically, okay. Let's look at a national phase application, right? Um, professional fee six hundred and forty US. Okay. Official fee one hundred and sixty US. So that's to file the national phase application in Singapore. Sure. Then when it comes to request for examination, where we are looking at um, requesting for search and examine, um, then it's um, 1,000 in total. Uh, professional fee is 400 US. Official fee is 1,560. When I talk about official fee, it means what's payable to the government, to IPOS. Okay, so that's where IPOS will do the search as well as the examination together. Okay, now what happens if you're relying on uh, one of the corresponding applications, uh, search report, a favorable search report, then the official fee drops from 1,560, it drops to 1,080 US dollars. So add on with our professional fee of 400, that makes it about 1,005 US. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, then the next stage would be you move on to um, bring your grant, right? So everything passes and then um, you want to pay for your grant fee and that is about 600, uh, about a about thousand US. Yeah. Official plus attorney? Yes. No, no, sorry. That's much lower. I think about 520 US. Yeah. 120 uh, professional fee. And uh, sorry, 520 official fee and uh, professional fee and 160 official fee. I'll just repeat that. Huh? For the grant stage, professional fee is 520, official fee is 160. Sorry about that. Sure. So there's another question. And does Singapore has a, a grace period concept like in India, for example, if you, uh, if you make a disclosure of your invention or something like that, in front of a learned audience, then you get 12 months, even after that disclosure in the public, I mean, in terms of the learned audience disclosure to file your patent application. The US also gives you a grace period of 12 months to file an application post public disclosure. Do you yeah. have a grace period in Singapore as well? Yes, 12 months. Uh, from any kind of disclosure in front of anybody? Uh, from a previous filing? Um, from a invention, I mean, uh, from an exhibition that is um, listed in the Patents Act, so it's called uh, authorized um, um, exhibition. Yes, and if there's been some bad faith, uh, if you're able to prove that you know, this was um, disclosed, uh, even though it was there was a confidentiality agreement in place and that was breached, uh, then there's a possibility. But that's also not as as broad as what the US is then. It's not like you can really make a, an article or a blog on it and then get 12 yeah. months. Yeah. <clears throat> well, uh, there was another question on the software side in terms of what are the career opportunities for freshers in IP practice in Singapore? Do you think that the practice is going up or is it stabilized? Is it already very competitive? Could you give an idea to people who might be wanting to maybe relocate to Singapore in the future? it will continue to go up, but it's not a career that people are very excited about. Um, firstly, I find in Singapore, um, people, it's very hard to, I'm not sure how it is in India, but it's very hard to wrap your head around IP, right? And it's also incredibly technical. So I remember when IPOS was trying to find examiners, you know, after the 14th of February, um, they had a lot of um, um, sort of, uh, can I see? There are a lot of benefits to become an examiner, you know, where they provided a lot of grants, things like that. But they couldn't get people. Basically, people didn't want to sit for the exams. Uh, the exams, of course, were incredibly difficult and they would just drop off, even though it was fully paid for. 
Okay, so I I believe that it will continue to grow. It's just that um, it will be a slow process. Then the second part comes um, that is for Singaporeans. So then, well, what about foreigners, right? Why can't they come on? Because um, there are many foreigners from India, from China, who want to to be in the IP field in Singapore. But Singapore has such a stringent um, work visa, um, you know, culture now. Um, it's just so difficult um, to get a visa uh, in Singapore. So I think those are the things that um, will be a challenge. Uh, yeah. So uh, one final question we'll take up before we end uh, the session. Uh, uh, there's a question uh, from VR. So it says that what is the process for rendering a granted patent invalid in Singapore? Like in India, for example, we can either file a post-grant opposition within one year from the date of grant, or we can file a revocation petition at the IPAP Intellectual Property Appellate Board, or we can file a revocation by means of a counterclaim in, a, in an infringement suit in the court. Uh, what are the options of invalidating a patent? Which forums does one go to? Same. We have the same things um, where you, you file a revocation or an invalidation. So I can um, give you two examples which might make it easier to understand. Um, like about a year and a half ago or two years ago, we had this software pattern that was invalidated. So this software pattern was actually... Um, um, you know, the invention was developed, uh, came about uh, by a hospital in Singapore, one of the big hospitals in Singapore. Then they engaged um, a software company who also had doctors um, involved uh, in the software company to actually develop the, um, the program. Okay, so it was a blood test uh, software program. Okay, at the end of the day, this software company proceeded to file a patent for the, for the invention. Okay, and um, the Singapore Hospital challenged that subsequently to say that they should be um, jointly named as owners of the patent and they were successful. Okay, so that is uh, one way, right? But, but, but that, was, that was sort of filed after the grant of the patent, right? Yeah. And it was filed at the patent office itself then? It was filed at the patent office, it, yes. Is there like an appellate authority in Singapore as well? Sorry, again? Is there like an appellate authority like this IPAB in India? So after the IPOS, if you don't get through it at IPOS stage, then you appeal to the High Court. And then you appeal again to the Court of Appeal. So that's how it would go. So there's no special appellate board only for uh, or only for patent matters, for example. You have to go straight uh, to the High Court as regards any appeal from the patent office is concerned. Oh yes. You, if you Once you get into the court system, right, you go um, to the High Court. Um, and Early, uh, late last year, we passed an act also to consolidate because um, prior to that act, right, certain matters um, like copyright and all that, you could start in the, in the lower courts. So now everything is sort of consolidated in the, um, in the IP courts, which is in the high court. Okay. Um, then with regard to the revocation, right, does it need to start in the high court, like say it's a counterclaim um, to an invalidation, right? Um, so there also, there was a recent case where um, it was done at the um, as a counterclaim in the high court invalidation case, and uh, the attorney who was acting for the defendant um, or the yeah defendant actually um, you know said that um, the um, the revocation should actually take place with the IPOS, right? Go back to the registry, and so the court decided in favor of that. Yes, so you have to start back at the IPOS for revocation. Excellent. I think we're beyond time. Uh, there are a couple of questions, but let's park them for another time and uh, we will probably try and answer them offline. If an email to that effect can be sent out, I can forward that to Renny and maybe she can revert back directly. Uh, Manoj and Gayatri, I think a direct revert backs would be better for your respective questions. Thank you very, very much, Renny. It was a pleasure uh, to have you. Thanks for spending your time and thank you everyone for joining in. Um, I saw a very healthy uh, um, uh, you know, participation and thank you very, very much for joining and look forward to continuing uh, uh, such interactions and thanks very, very much Renny once again. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye everyone. And yes, please feel free to drop me an email through Taro. Can, can, you, can you put out your email address once uh, so that people can sort of uh, reach out to you directly? Uh, uh, why don't I just put it in the chat here? Sure. And? 
Excellent. Thanks very much, Rani, and uh, was a pleasure. Thanks very much again. Thanks, everyone. Yes, I'll share the presentation. I think somebody's asked that deeper. Yes. yes. So share it with us and Bhomika will share it with everybody who's, who's yes, there. Yes, I'll send it to Tarun and you'll share it. Thanks, Rani. Pleasure. Hey, take Thanks. care. Bye, everyone. Stay safe. Bye. Yeah.